Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, just to get out of the way, if you could please uh, silence your cell phones to avoid any interruptions. And uh, I know it's warm in here. We apologize. Um, it's a building heat, um, air conditioning. We can do much about it. Uh, my name is uh, Mohammed Mohammed. I'm the executive director uh, here at the Jerusalem Fund and Palestine Center. And uh, on behalf of our board of directors and staff, it's a pleasure to welcome you all here today. And it's an honor to introduce and welcome back our distinguished speaker, Omar Barghouti, who has come here all the way from Palestine. And for those of you who don't know, we had uh, the pleasure of hosting Mr. Barghouti back in 2012. So it's been a while. Uh, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank everyone at the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights uh, who co-sponsored this event and helped make it possible, so thank you. Um, a bit of a background, uh, Omar Barghouti is a human rights defender and a co-founder of the Palestinian-led Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions Movement for Palestinian Rights. He holds bachelor's and master's degrees in electrical engineering from Columbia University and a master's degree in philosophy from Tel Aviv University. He is the 2017 co-recipient of the Gandhi Peace Award, which I believe he just received, and the author of BDS, The Global Struggle for Palestinian Rights. His commentaries and interviews have uh, appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Financial Times, Newsweek, The Guardian, Politico, and on BBC, Bloomberg TV, MSNBC, CNN, among other outlets. In his talk, Mr. Barghouti will reflect on the growing successes of the Palestinian-led boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, which he helped to found. He will also address the future challenges presented by growing repression campaigns against this movement on the state, campus, and individual levels. He will speak for about 40 minutes, after which we will have a Q&A session. And uh, for our online audience, you can join the discussion by tweeting your questions at Palestine Center. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Mr. Omar Barghouti. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mohammed. I thank the Palestine Center for hosting me, uh, and I'm glad to be with you. Uh, I will talk actually less than that, uh, hoping to have more questions. Uh, I will introduce the BDS movement uh, for those who are not as aware of it. I will present some of the main successes we've had, but also the philosophy of the movement, some of the challenges we have uh, faced, especially of late in the last couple of years, uh, and then maybe we can have some discussion. The Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions, or BDS movement, was launched by the absolute majority in Palestinian civil society in 2005. Political parties, trade unions, women's unions, farmers' unions, and so on and so forth, representing Palestinian communities in all parts, in all constituencies, Palestinians in the occupied territories, Palestinian citizens of Israel, and Palestinians who are refugees outside historic Palestine. Uh, as such, the movement has called for basic Palestinian rights, all Palestinian rights, under international law, specifically ending the occupation, ending the system of racial discrimination, which meets the United Nations definition of apartheid, and the right of Palestinian refugees to return. Palestinian refugees and the internally displaced Palestinians together constitute about 68% of our people, making the issue of refugee rights the most uh, important, the most significant right for the Palestinian uh, people in order to exercise our inalienable right to self-determination. Now, in 2005, when we launched BDS, we were inspired by the South African anti-apartheid movement, by the US civil rights movement, but the main inspiration for BDS came from a very long heritage of Palestinian nonviolent resistance, which you don't hear much about in this country, thanks to your so-called media. Uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, um, we, to achieve an, an end to the occupation and to apartheid and the right of Palestinian refugees uh, to return, we've called for effective nonviolent measures to isolate Israel's regime of occupation, settler colonialism, and apartheid, and the corporations and institutions that are complicit in Israel's violations of Palestinian rights. So when you think about that, we do not call 
for boycotting a specific identity. We do not target identity in the BDS movement, we target complicity. And that's a very important part of our philosophy. So in the academic and cultural boycott, we target Israeli institutions rather than Israeli academics and artists. Unlike the South African boycott, by the way, those of you who are old enough, like I am, to remember the South African anti-apartheid movement or to have participated in it as I, wa as I did, would remember that what we did then in the 80s was a blanket boycott against everyone and everything South African every single academic, every single artist, and so on. The Palestinian-led BDS movement does not do that. It takes a more nuanced approach targeting the institutions due to their complicity in Israel's violations of Palestinian rights under international law. So that, that's a very important difference. Uh, uh, since 2005 until now, we've achieved quite a lot. We've grown this movement uh, uh, from the, the small beginnings to the global movement that it is today, being fought by the power of the State of Israel and its many allies in, in, in governments in the West, especially uh, in the United States, in Europe, Australia, Canada, and, and elsewhere. Uh, since 2014, in fact, Israel has started to deal with the BDS movement as a movement that's having a strategic impact. And that's a key change that happened in 2014. Up until 2013, Israel dismissed the movement as a nuisance at best, some leftist thing that they can ignore. Since 2014, they started to see it as a movement that's having a strategic impact. Uh, why did that change happen around that time? You might remember the Soda Stream campaign, Scarlett Johansson. You might remember the American Studies Association decision <coughs> to endorse the full academic boycott of Israeli universities. Things were starting to happen. But what you might not have noticed then, that we started to have an economic impact around that time. So it wasn't just the Scarlett Johansson and the American Studies, both extremely important, but also the beginning of an economic impact. So for many years, we've achieved quite a lot in the academic and cultural boycott, with major artists refusing to play Tel Aviv as the new Sun City, with many academics refusing to participate in Israeli conferences or exercising what we call the silent boycott, not announcing a boycott, just not going, uh, which is a very important part of the boycott. We started to see companies being impacted. So I'll give an example. Veolia, one of the largest companies in the world, which was involved in the tram uh, uh, rail that connected Israel's illegal colonies in the occupied uh, uh, Palestinian territory to the city of Jerusalem, therefore rendering services to illegal Israeli colonies, violating international law. Veolia suffered uh, over a seven-year BDS campaign uh, 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 that, that started in 2008 and ended in 2015, suffered more than $20 billion worth of tenders and contracts, billion with a B. Uh, um, so ultimately, in 2015, Veolia had to end its entire involvement in the Israeli economy, all its violations of international law, and had to leave the Israeli uh, market. This triggered a domino effect. After Veolia, we saw Orange Telecommunications pull out of Israel, CRH, the largest building materials company from Ireland, pull out of Israel as well, and G4S towards the end of 2016. G4S is the largest security company in the world. It was involved in securing Israeli prisons where Palestinians are tortured. And right now, we have more than 1,000 Palestinian prisoners on hunger strike asking for dignity and liberty and for improving their conditions in Israel's apartheid dungeons. So G4S was involved in the Israeli prison system as well as securing Israeli colonies in the occupied territories and checkpoints and so on and so forth. G4S had to end its involvement in almost all of these violations of human rights, except for one, it's still involved in the Israeli prison, uh, uh, um, Israeli police training uh, center in Jerusalem, and that's why we are continuing the BDS campaign against G4S. But one of the biggest companies on earth had to bow to BDS pressure and get out of all these projects. This is important, not just for the Palestine movement, but for all progressive movements, for all justice movements that we work with, whether it's the black justice movement, the racial justice, economic justice, 
the LGBTQI communities, the feminist movement, the Latinos, and many, many movements <coughs> around the world uh, 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 see this as very important. It's not every day that a human rights movement gets a huge company on its knees to respect our human rights. It takes a lot of very strategic campaigning, a lot of self-discipline, and a lot of prioritization to get to that point. And we're proud that we've done that. <coughs> Getting there, we've established uh, uh, amazing intersectional uh, coalitions with various justice movements around the world. And what I mean by that, not opportunistic or transactional type of coalitions, whereby we come to your demonstration and you come to our demonstration. It's nice, but that doesn't cut it. That's not enough. Uh, 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 we evolved organic links that see that justice for blacks in the United States is also justice for the Palestinians and vice versa. Working with Latinos against the wall with Mexico or against working with blacks and Latinos on the mass incarceration system is important for humanity, not just for blacks and Latinos in the United States and vice versa. Connecting our struggles is not a luxury. It's an absolute essential component of today's world because under the current far right administration in this country, and the rise of the far right from Tel Aviv to, to uh, Europe, to India, to elsewhere, it is incumbent upon us, human rights activists everywhere, to connect our struggles in an organic and principled way. Otherwise, we cannot win. I've said this before, and I repeat it. Uh, 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 isolated, we can never win. United, we can. So it's very important that we unite those uh, struggles. Um, so BDS has shifted over the years from having an impact in the economic, in the academic and cultural sphere to having more of an uh, impact in the economic uh, sphere. This has led Israel to shift its strategy completely in dealing with the, uh, with the movement. In 2014, Israel adopted a new strategy, in a way admitting the failure of its previous strategy. From 2005 until 2014, Israel's strategy to fight BDS was the Brand Israel Campaign fighting BDS with propaganda, sending um, Israeli artists and academics and gay activists and, and, and whatnot around the world to project Israel's prettier face, as they put it in their brochures, Israel's prettier face, so that Israel is no longer associated with occupation and fundamentalism and violence, but is associated with being a cultural hub and IT hub and, and, and so on and so forth. This has failed miserably. So in 2014, they adopted a new strategy a top-down strategy that involves uh, mobilizing Israel's massive intelligence services, the Shabak, the Mossad, the military intelligence, in spying on BDS activists, on sabotaging BDS work networks, uh, cyber sabotage or more than cyber sabotage. Uh, legal warfare is a, a key component, I would say the key component of that new strategy. As you're seeing here in the United States, Israel is passing, Israel's lobby, is, is passing anti-BDS legislation one state after another. The US Congress is now uh, in the process of passing anti-BDS legislation. We all need to stop that legislation. It's extremely important uh, for us, and I'll explain why. It's not just about Palestine. What they're doing by trying to target BDS in this country and to make it illegal to support BDS. If you support BDS, you might be violating the law. You might be committing a crime if this law passes. What they're trying to do is to suppress free speech on Palestine as an opening to suppress free speech, period. Those who do not remember McCarthyism should better go back and read about McCarthyism. Initially, it targeted a very small uh, 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 group, a very small demographic that people can just dismiss. Yeah, it's targeting the communists, so I shouldn't worry, right? Because I'm not a communist. And then it targeted God knows who, and, and on and on and on. And then it targeted everyone who dissented with a party line. Uh, uh, exact same process is happening right now. They're targeting Palestinians because we're the weakest of the weak, because they feel they can get away with it. It's easier. You, it's much more difficult to target uh, the Black Lives Matter, for example. But be assured, if they succeed in suppressing our freedom of speech on Palestine, they will go after every progressive movement in this country. 
you will gradually lose the very meaning of the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, the protection of free speech, which is one of the gems you still have in this country, and we should all try to protect it. Uh, that's the meaning of this anti-BDS legislation. And we should therefore widen the circle that opposes it from just the Palestine solidarity groups to the liberal mainstream that should work with us on principle to oppose those draconian uh, anti-democratic uh, and uh, unconstitutional measures that are trying to suppress the BDS movement. The wider the circle that opposes it, the higher the chance will be to succeed. So that's extremely uh, important. As part of this uh, new strategy, Israel uh, started threatening BDS activists, including myself in person, with civil assassination. We have we don't quite understand what that means, but that's the term they used uh, to threaten us, <coughs> with travel bans, as was imposed uh, against me, and all other sorts of uh, uh, threats, implicit or explicit. Uh, they've also tried to uh, tarnish the reputation of BDS activists. In fact, the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, which is the Israeli ministry that was established predominantly to coordinate the Israeli government efforts in fighting BDS, last year, 2016, established the tarnishing unit and you know i'm not even making this up that's what they call it the tarnishing unit and you can guess they used to be smarter in in sanitizing those terms you know the peacekeeping unit what uh, they stopped especially with trump they don't feel that they have to act they can be natural drop the mask and just be be yourself you know so they're being themselves trump allows them to be themselves dropping the mask uh, uh, so it's the tarnishing unit that uh, uh, aims at tarnishing the reputation of BDS activists predominantly, digging up, as they say, any dirt in their past, and if they cannot find any dirt, they fabricate it. So that's the tarnishing unit. Those are the tactics increasingly being used by Israel. Well, guess what? It is alienating not just those who support Palestinian rights. Obviously, it's alienating those. It's alienating a much wider circle in the liberal mainstream. People are disgusted with this McCarthyite uh, 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 crusade against BDS. Even those who do not support BDS can see Israel's tactics of intimidation and bullying and tarnishing as something completely intolerable, completely unacceptable. So for the first time, we're, f we're finding many, many groups that have never taken a position in support of BDS coming out in support of our right to pursue Palestinian rights through BDS tactics. And that's a very important uh, success that we've had. We we're seeing a shift in public opinion in this country. The Brookings Institution, for example, had a poll last December that showed 46% of all Americans support sanctions or tougher measures against Israel to stop its settlements and occupation. Almost half of all Americans support sanctions on Israel. How is this Congress reflecting this? Zero, uh, uh, which is a challenge, which is a challenge for all of us, how to leverage the change in public opinion into a beginning of affecting policy change at the city council level, at the state level, and then hopefully at Congress level. But certainly at city level, we can do much more to leverage this growing support, even among Jewish Americans. And this is a key point that terribly worries the current far-right Israeli government. Among Jewish Americans, according to a J Street poll, no less, a J Street poll in 2014, uh, almost half of uh, uh, non-Orthodox Jewish American men support a full boycott of Israel. A full boycott of Israel, almost half. Men under, uh, non-Orthodox Jewish American men under 40. 46% to be precise, support a full boycott of Israel to end its occupation. Uh, uh, this is an extremely important uh, uh, poll that shows just how much uh, uh, BDS has grown in the last number of years. And Israel is terribly worried about this, this, uh, uh, this drastic shift uh, that is happening. They see this as a strategic disaster for Israel's regime of occupation and, uh, and apartheid. So the challenges are very serious. The challenges are real, but the movement is growing. Major pension funds are pulling out. Major companies are being forced to end their involvement in human rights violations by, by Israel's uh, regime. Uh, uh, major academic associations, trade unions, women's groups, and so on are supporting BDS. Churches in this country, mainline churches, have taken 
softer BDS measures, not full BDS, but softer BDS measures, which are still very drastic. The United Methodist Church, for example, in 2016, early 2016, decided to divest its pension fund of all Israeli banks. An extremely important step because of Israel's bank's involvement in financing the occupation, the settlements, the wall, and, and so on. Uh, the Presbyterians divested from HP, Caterpillar, and Motorola Solutions in 2014. United Church of Christ, the Mennonites, and so on and so forth. So it's hitting the mainstream. Uh, uh, six out of 11 National Football League players, NFL players, last year refused to take a trip to come to Israel, a propaganda trip to go to Israel. Six out of 11. This would have been unimaginable just a year ago. Of the 26 Oscar nominees in 2016, none took a very expensive Israeli junket. None of the 26. Who would have thought we had any impact on Hollywood? <coughs> Uh, but clearly, the impact is growing. We should not see the attacks on BDS as reflective that the movement is on the wane, that the movement is getting weaker. Exactly the opposite. <coughs> they wouldn't go to such extremes, such McCarthyite extremes in targeting BDS if we were not growing, and growing at a very, very impressive rate and reaching the mainstream. So mainstreaming the movement is a key challenge, but first we have to defend our right to assert Palestinian rights through BDS. And as I said, this is a challenge for all of us and well beyond us to the liberal mainstream in this country. I'll stop here so that we have enough time for questions, uh, uh, comments. Thank you. Yes. Sorry. Hi, uh, you're a very good speaker, I'm very impressive. Thank you. I, I'm curious. We have a microphone, one, one second, please. Yeah, we have a microphone. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm, should I hold it? So, uh, I'm, I'm uh, impressed that you went to Tel Aviv University. Could you tell us just a little bit about being an, a Palestinian student at Tel Aviv University? What was it like? But the other main question I want to know, what are your plans in America? Do you have enough uh, groups here uh, organizations, financial support, all of that, mm -hmm. so that we can know how to help you. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, I studied philosophy. Initially, I started a PhD program at Tel Aviv, uh, ethics in the <laughs> philosophy department. Uh, not the easiest thing to study at Tel Aviv University. <laughs> um, um, but as uh, part of my studies was doing it by email, not going to campus a lot. So that was one of the key issues to me because it wasn't easy to go to campus, especially towards the end. Uh, as I finally decided to get a master's degree instead of pursuing my PhD, uh, before I graduated, there was a huge campaign against me uh, with my picture being on posters and a number saying, if you see him, call us. <laughs> and a petition, uh, can't remember, 2008? around that time. Uh, the petition was signed by, I think, 180,000 people calling on Tel Aviv University to expel me. Uh, um, so that was my experience in a nutshell. I had a wonderful professor, my advisor, Professor Marcelo Dascal uh, at Tel Aviv. Um, so that's, in a nutshell, my experience there. Uh, whether the BDS movement has enough partners in the US and how it's growing, obviously, we wouldn't have reached uh, uh, the ivory tower of Hollywood or the trade unions or the churches if it weren't for the many amazing activists and groups, whether the US Campaign for Palestinian Rights, Jewish Voice for Peace, Code Pink, uh, uh, Friends of Sabil North America, uh, AFSC, and many, many, many groups in the United States that are doing amazing ama an amazing job in, uh, 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 in articulating Palestinian rights in the mainstream, in arguing why Americans should end their complicity in Israel's regime of oppression, which is a, a, a profound moral obligation. We're not asking people for charity when we ask an American church, an American trade union, an American pension fund to end its complicity in Israel's occupation and apartheid. We're not asking for a charity. We're asking them to fulfill a moral obligation to do no harm to us. So I think we have quite a lot of groups that are working because BDS is not a, a, a a hierarchical, pyramidic type of structure. It's a, it's a loose network 
of groups who agree with the BDS call of 2005, with the main principles of the call, <coughs> and with the tactic of boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Of course, this global movement is, is led and guided by the Palestinian BDS National Committee, which is the largest coalition Palestinian society, but again, led in the very loose meaning of led, setting the main guidelines and the main strategy, but every group decides its own tactics, its own targets, and how to pursue it. Sure. The main website is bdsmovement.net. 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 One word, yes. Yes, ma'am. Let's just wait for the mic, please. One second. I gather um, um, President Abbas is coming to the White House in a couple of weeks. I'm hoping, hoping something good is going to come of it. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, <laughs> you had to end on a bitter note. Okay. Uh, I have no expectations of that. Uh, um, there is no current Palestinian leader that has any democratic mandate. It's a fact. It's not a matter of opinion. No Palestinian leader today has a, 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 a democratic mandate to represent Palestinians, let alone compromise on Palestinian rights. The current administration is so anti-Palestinian that it's impossible to imagine anything positive coming out of it. It's just more dictates and a very pliable, very obsequious Palestinian officialdom that will just follow orders uh, very obediently. That's as much as I can expect. Our hope is with the people, with uh, civil society, with people of conscience. That's where the hope lies. We can make the change, not some unelected official anywhere. Yes. <coughs> thank you, okay, and thank you for your remarks. Um, two short questions. Number one, why did Israel relax the travel ban and allow you to come here? Uh, which I'm very glad that they did. And number two, uh, could you tell us what industries or institutions you are targeting currently, please? Okay, on the first issue, I'm under a gag order. So I cannot discuss my case, unfortunately. So they attack me, they spread lies, fabrications on me in the media, and I'm not allowed to respond. Only when the, this process, this interrogation process is over, can I have the pleasure of responding. <laughs> and I will have the pleasure of responding when the time is right. But now I'm not, I cannot, under, under this uh, gag order. Uh, and um, the second part was which industries we target. Um, we have certain criteria in, in the BDS movement at, at large around the world for selecting BDS targets. If you pursue, if you start a campaign against every boycottable company, we'll end up spreading ourselves so thin that we will never be effective. Again, it's, it's, it's not, BDS is not just about moral principles and moral commitment. That's extremely essential, but it's not sufficient. It's about being strategic and effective. We're doing it to achieve our rights and therefore, we have to keep our eyes on the ball. If we just feel good, yes, I'm boycotting this and boycotting that and, uh, and have no impact on anything in life, how are we serving Palestinian rights? How are we getting any closer to Palestinian freedom, justice, and equality? That's why we, we've adopted, we've evolved certain criteria for selecting a BDS target. First, the level of complicity. The more complicit a company is, obviously, the easier a target it makes. We can mobilize public pressure against a company that's deeply complicit. A company that sells flowers to Israeli settlements is far less complicit than a company that sells security to Israel's wall and colonies. So I target the latter rather than the former. It's much, it makes a much better target, although the, the former is also violating international law. So it's a matter of prioritizing. The second criterion is the potential for cross-movement coalition building if I target a company X, which only violates Palestinian rights, or I target a company Y, which violates black rights in this country, as well as Palestinian rights, the latter is a better target. It allows me to build coalitions with Black Lives Matter, let's say, a principled coalition targeting a common enemy, so to speak. So that's a second criterion. The third criterion, media appeal. If, if two companies are as complicit and allow for coalition building, but one is a well-known brand 
that people can identify and can see in the supermarket, uh, on the streets, uh, and so on. And a second is such an obscure company that no one has heard of, clearly the, the, the first would make a much better target. The fourth, the last but not least, uh, 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 criterion that activists sometimes forget is the potential for success. Again, we're, we're in it to make, a to make a difference, to make a change. We should not embark on a campaign against a company where we have no reasonable chance of success. That's a waste of our extremely precious time. As activists, as volunteers, we have no time to waste. We have to be as, as, as efficient as possible, as scientific as possible, and ar as artistic as possible, because BDS is an art and a science. So we have to be very effective and very strategic. We have to win. If I cannot win, I should not target this company. So that's in a nutshell how we target. So it's not a particular industry uh, per se. If you fulfill those criteria, you reach uh, better results, I think. Uh, sorry, there was another question here, and then you. Um, thank you. Uh, listening to you is always uh, such a pleasure because you're so incredibly um, articulate and um, and uh, able to really um, make us all feel as though we have something positive that we can do. Um, my question actually grows out of what you just said, which is um, assuming that um, that BDS succeeds um, on a large scale, then what? What um, what is the vision for what should, what should emerge from the success of the BDS movement? Um, the BDS National Committee, the Palestinian BDS National Committee, the BNC, w which as I said is, is the largest coalition in Palestinian society, uh, does not agree on much beyond the three rights, ending the occupation, ending apartheid, and the right of return. Uh, um, as such an enormous coalition, it is very difficult to go beyond those three points. So we have never taken a position on one state versus two states. I don't mean one state versus two states. I mean, um, what is supposed to happen? Um, okay, we might be good activists, but we're not prophets. <laughs> so I'm not sure I can predict what might happen, but one thing is for sure. If BDS succeeds, it'll be a much more ethical, much better future, regardless what solution we reach. Yes, and then, and then you. Thank you. Uh, as you mentioned during your uh, uh, presentation that there is uh, uh, a lot of uh, anti-BDS legislation mm -hmm. that's starting to be uh, put in place in uh, many states uh, in the US and also in the Western, uh, in Western countries, including uh, the extremely liberal uh, Canadian Prime Minister's uh, statements about BDS. Uh, does the movement have uh, risk mitigation for uh, dystopian scenario where actually uh, a lot of uh, BDS activists end up uh, being charged on, um, um, uh, thrown in jail for criminal charges and things of this sort. So in case those uh, legislation, uh, legislations are put in place and, and uh, implemented. Okay, uh, the, the worst situation is in France actually, uh, uh, the land of the free. Uh, free except for on Palestine. It's the, it's the dark ages in France for Palestine activism. Uh, it's the only country on earth where it's currently criminal to advocate for BDS. The only, not even Israel, <coughs> criminalizes BDS, by the way. So Israel is trying to get, its lobby is trying to get Congress to criminalize BDS, whereas Israel itself does not yet criminalize BDS. It deals with it as a strategic challenge. It, ha it has an anti-BDS law that makes it a tort, not a crime, to advocate for BDS, but it's a very difficult law to implement. Uh, um, so in a nutshell, it is not so easy to criminalize BDS because it's, it is a matter of free speech. For example, uh, Israel thought that this was such a winning strategy for them to pursue the legal warfare, or lawfare as we call it, against BDS, trying to make it illegal to support BDS. They did a lot of that in Europe before doing it in the United States. Uh, and I'll talk about both, because Europe and the US are the most important battlefields for this uh, attempt to, to make BDS illegal. In Europe, uh, we succeeded to get the governments of Sweden, Ireland, and the Netherlands, a very pro-Israel government, to support the right to BDS. Now, if Ireland and Sweden may have been slightly predictable as liberal pro-Palestinian states traditionally, the Netherlands is not, has never been. 
extremely pro-Israel government, extremely pro-Israel government, but a principled government that came out and said, according to the Dutch constitution and the European Convention on Human Rights, advocating for Palestinian rights via BDS tactics is perfectly legitimate. It's free speech. After that, with a lot of lobbying and civil society action in Europe, we got 350 political parties, trade unions, NGOs, including some of the biggest across Europe, to come out in support of the right to BDS. That's what I was mentioning earlier. We go well beyond the Palestine solidarity groups and the BDS groups. We got everyone who has any respect for themselves as liberals to come out and say, this is a matter of free speech. Until we got Federica Mogherini, the head of the foreign affairs in the EU, in October 2016, to come out and say, we support the right to BDS. The EU opposes BDS, but supports the right to BDS. So that was a major, major blow to Israel's legal warfare against the BDS movement. Now, in the US, the story is very different. Here, the lobby is dominant, as everyone knows. And Israel can pass legislation on anything, more or less. I mean, uh, the legislature of Illinois, if I remember correctly, passed the, the anti-BDS legislation unanimously. When was the last time that the state legislature of Illinois passed anything unanimously? I don't know. I don't know. But it's APAC apparently brings up this harmony among elected <laughs> officials in a way that's so magical that no one else can. Uh, um, so it's easy for them to pass anti-BDS legislation in the state legislatures, in Congress. It's not too difficult. I mean, we will put up a resistance. Our partners are putting up a lot of resistance. But we know we don't have much of a chance to, to, to stop the, uh, Israel from passing anti-BDS legislation in most places in this country. They, they, they know the game. As even Thomas Friedman admitted, elected officials in this country are bought and paid for by the lobby. If Thomas Friedman says that, the one moment I agreed with him in history is that. <laughs> but the difficulty in this country is that, for, for Israel's lobby, is the First Amendment. Unlike in Europe, freedom of speech in this country is a robust right that is protected by the Constitution. We don't have any equivalent protection, by the way, in Europe. Their freedom of speech is very precarious. It's not as solid as in the US. So Israel is going against a constitutional right, a, a, a time-honored constitutional right. Boycotts in this country are very deeply rooted in struggles from the grape uh, 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 farmers in, in California, the civil rights movement, the anti-apartheid South Africa movement, and so on and so forth. Boycotts are extremely important in this country and protected by the Constitution. So we think that a legal challenge that reaches the Supreme Court will give us a big win against all these anti-BDS legislation. But that, doesn't, that should not make us uh, sit on our hands and do nothing. We should do everything to resist the legislation one by one, every time, and form those big coalitions that are forming now, right now, with the American Civil Liberties Union, the National Lawyers Guild, Center for Constitutional Rights, Palestine Legal. Many groups are getting together to, to defend the right to BDS. Uh, uh, so that's, the, the, in a nutshell, the, the picture in the US. They're succeeding a lot, but we haven't reached the courts yet. So we'll see who'll succeed at the end. Uh, there was, yes, and, and then you, yes. Um, a group in our church <coughs> community uh, has been working to increase awareness of BDS. and what Which church? If you the, the Unitarian Universalist yes, Church of, of Arlington. Yes. And you probably know through Tracy Rogers. Yes, of course. Um, in our dialogues with, in our community, we have been in contact <coughs> with several Jewish communities. And one of them, the most prominent, and actually a quite liberal and one dedicated to social justice, <coughs> we are unable to persuade them or their rabbi that BDS is not anti-Israel or against the Jewish state or is ultimately calling for the end of the Jewish state. How do you respond? OK, uh, first, I don't think it's worth the effort to try to convince those who don't believe that Palestinians deserve equal rights, I wouldn't spend a lot of my time trying to convince them, as I wouldn't have spent a lot of time trying to convince the KKK why <laughs> blacks deserve equal rights in Alabama. We should convince everyone else, but who cares about the KKK opinion? 
I mean, they'll come around when they see it's the fashion now, you know, racism is becoming uncool, they will join the bandwagon. Uh, um, so yeah, racism on Palestine is still cool. You still get away with saying racist things against Arabs, against Muslims, against Palestinians in this country. I think we must be like the only group that it's okay to be racist against openly in public. Uh, uh, um, so I, I think we should not hold the pursuit of justice hostage to those who are racist enough not to recognize us as equal humans that deserve equal rights. That's the key point. The second point is that BDS pursues Palestinian rights under international law. Why should that be interpreted as a destruction of a death of, a, of anything? Why should I consider getting my rights under international law, equal rights like everyone else, destruction of something? Think about it logically. If I get freedom, justice, and equality, what would that destroy? Slavery, inequality, and injustice, period. The only thing that should be worried about being destroyed, although I wouldn't use that very violent term because it's a nonviolent movement after all, is a, a, an order that's unjust. That's the only thing that will be ended if BDS were to succeed. The second point is the, the, the implicit and sometimes very explicit anti-Semitism charge, right? I mean, you hear that all the time. If you support BDS, especially if they use that with churches. I mean, it's very clear how this tactic is used in churches. Um, is BDS against Israel anti-Semitic because Israel is the only Jewish state? That's how the argument goes. Um, well, as I said earlier, if Palestinian rights uh, uh, should mean the end of something. It's an end of injustice. A movement that pursues Palestinian rights, equal rights under international law, does not hurt any particular community. Second, the argument itself is anti-Semitic. Saying that a boycott of Israel is anti-Semitic because it's equivalent to a boycott of all Jews is an anti-Semitic statement because it equates Israel and all Jews, as if all Jews are one monolithic sum that can be completely represented by the state of Israel. That is very anti-Semitic. Anyone who says all Jews are anything is making an anti-Semitic statement. W be it Israel or neo-fascists in Europe, it's the same. No one should say all Jews are, because there is no all Jews. There's human diversity among Jewish groups, like any human groups. Anyone who dehumanizes Jews by making them superhumans or, or subhumans is making a racist statement. And we should not accept that. A movement for Palestinian human rights cannot be racist against anyone else, cannot be per, uh, interpreted as a dis destruction of anything else except injustice. Yes. One quick follow up. The, the specific, but when we crack it down, it comes to the right of, it comes to the right of refugees to return yeah. with the implicit fact that if you had enough Palestinians returning to this Israel, the land of Israel, then you would no longer have a Jewish majority and that would put an end to the state of Israel as a Jewish state. Ending a supremacist order, that is bad because, <laughs> I mean, um, if I kick you out of your home, okay, and then a number of years afterwards, you wanna come back. I tell you, wait a minute. I mean, I might have allowed you alone to take the basement, but now you have too many children, so you can't come back. It's my home, damn it. I mean, you took my home, and now you won't let me back because I have too many children? That's the racist logic. Palestinians are not some immigrants escaping a war-torn region in Africa or Asia or Latin America who are begging to come to this land of opportunity called Israel. It's our homeland. We're the indigenous people of the land. We were ethnically cleansed. We have every right under international law to go home. If that destroys a certain supremacist order, why is that a problem? Since the whole BDS campaign is built on the model of South Africa, and uh, South Africa had its own specific characteristics, its own time and so on. How do you bridge, and uh, during my studies, I'm, I'm trying to map the differences between the BDS and South Africa's campaign, and I found at least 15. 
I can count few now. One of them, for example, is there is no Palestinian leadership, uh, uh, political leadership behind it. You have the Palestinian Authority who is 100% uh, is a subcontracting the occupation. It's not really, it's, it did sign, it's part of the BNC, it did sign, it did support the BDS uh, at certain levels. Never. Uh, I saw their signatures here and there in some places of some campaigns. Never. S other differences, for example, you don't have support from inside except for a few Israelis here and there who are supporting you know, BDS from inside. So while in South Africa, the whites were very much part of the uh, uh, campaign of ending apartheid. You have uh, uh, the Jewish issue here. It's beyond, you know, it's a religious issue. It's uh, uh, people who belong to this land, according to so many, you know, Christians around the world, especially in the U.S., you have, you don't have only the Jewish lobby, the biggest lobby for Israel and the Zionist cause is the Christian one. How do you overcome and bridge all these differences, especially that the whole BDS is built on, on, on something that is passé, that does not exist, that is not compatible to the Palestinian cause at all. It's geopolitically, name it, the Cold War is over, the U.S. is, 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 is actually who, who boycotted South Africa is now supporting Israel. You have no whatsoever, let's put it this way, um, um, wh what, it, what is the, our leverage? What is our leverage? How do you really compensate on these 15 gaps, which I can show you, you know, later on I can show you what I wrote about this, yeah, if I you're interested. I've studied South Africa carefully, but you, you, might, Carol. Have, you might have misheard oh, me, you. Uh, or, you, or I mis-expressed uh, uh, myself. I never said that BDS is based entirely on South Africa. I said that was one of the inspirations, the civil rights movement being another, but I said the main inspiration is a very long heritage of Palestinian nonviolent resistance. That's the key inspiration, not South Africa. South Africa is one of the main inspirations because, because there's a huge difference. There are many, many uh, 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 similarities between the two situations, but there are many huge differences as well. And there's no copy-paste in those movements. You learn a lot, you get inspired by a lot of what they did in South Africa, but we develop our own Palestinian relevant tactics that suit our own particularities, not the South African particularity. Um, now, the facts that you mentioned were also very real in the South African struggle. Uh, our relations are with leaders of the anti-apartheid movement, so we don't learn about the South African struggle just from textbooks, we learn it from the leaders who made the movement uh, succeed. Uh, uh, the number of whites that were active in the anti-apartheid movement was extremely, extremely low for decades. It took forever to mobilize white support. Of course, there were some that were very, very principled by tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of the white population. Many Jewish white activists, by the way, were very active in the South African anti-apartheid movement from the very start. But that that's not at all reflective of the white majority. I mean, the very, very tiny minority. Towards the end, towards the 80s, when the sanctions became more serious, when the boycotts and divestments and so on, uh, more and more whites started to join the, the ANC, started to join the, the struggle against apartheid. But even at the very end, uh, it was still a very, very small percentage. Yes, the number of Jewish Israelis joining the BDS movement uh, is still very small, agree. But their impact is quite big, as we've seen with several cultural boycott campaigns, that without our Israeli partners, we would not have succeeded to convince some artists to, to boycott Tel Aviv, for example. Their voice, despite being a tiny minority, was very important. But all colonial societies, at first, when faced with resistance from the indigenous or from the outside, circled the wagons, as, as you would say in the US. They circled the wagons. It's us versus the world, let's fight them together. And every colonial society, I mean, it's not specific to Israel at all. Every colonial society is the <coughs> same. But that's only at first. When the resistance starts really uh, impacting them, having a serious impact, then you see some cracks in this wall of, 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 uh, uh, of unity, this tribal wall that we all belong together against the whole world. It starts breaking up. And you see a lot more uh, dissent. Now, you mentioned the lobby in this country or the, the, the Jewish and Christian lobbies for Israel in this country, which, of course, are very formidable 
and the South African apartheid regime had nothing comparable. So the South African apartheid regime had the corporate lobby, the Coca-Colas and the, uh, you know, the big Polaroids and, and, and General Motors, those were the lobby. And those are not small lobbies. I mean, the big corporate America was always a huge lobby, but still nothing comparable to the Israel lobby, whether the evangelical Christian or the Jewish Zionist lobby. But look what's happening in the Jewish community in this country. Israel relies totally that the Jewish community is solid behind Israel. Well, that was 10 years ago. This is so 10 years ago. Now, life has changed. You go to any main campus in this country and you see the number of Jewish activists in the BDS groups. Disproportionately high number of Jewish activists in any BDS group in this country. It is refreshing to see how many Jewish millennials are joining the struggle for Palestinian rights. It's not just us. It's not just us saying this. Shabtai Shavit, a Mossad chief for seven years in Israel, wrote an article 2014, if I'm not mistaken. He pointed to this particular fact, the growing Jewish support for Palestinian rights, young Jewish support in the US for Palestinian rights, as one of the strategic disasters for Israel's regime. So they know that life is changing. When I went to school here, when I went to Columbia University, almost every Jewish student at Columbia was a Zionist and in support of Israel voluntarily. Today, you go to the same Columbia University. I was there three days ago. What a difference. What a difference. The Palestine group, the, Palestine, the student group for Palestine has so many wonderful Jewish activists. And, and it's a trend on campus, Jewish professors and Jewish students and so on. So life is changing, and, and they realize that. They cannot speak of this monolithic Jewish community that supports Israel. That is gone. Life is changing. Where they still have a lot of power and influence is at the policy-making level, granted. There, we haven't done very well. But in, in South Africa, in the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, which I was a tiny part of, I do remember how many years it took us to start having an impact on the Reagan administration. It took forever. It took like 30 years. Generations of activists fought against the US complicity in the South African apartheid regime until finally Reagan was the last on earth to, to, to impose any meaningful sanctions on South Africa after the whole world imposed sanctions on South Africa. That took a lot of grassroots movement building when the churches and the unions and the women's groups and the student groups, when everybody led, led by black activists in this country reached a, a, a level of power, they built enough momentum, then the policymakers had to listen. So we should not expect Congress to wake up and be moral. It never will. We can expect Congress to listen to our voices if we can muster enough support. And that's the only recipe. Building a movement from the grassroots up, we cannot cut corners. It takes time, it takes patience, but there's no other way. Sorry? Did, did we have? I had a couple of meetings today, and it seems like some space is opening. Some. I don't want to exaggerate. Some. <laughs> yes, there's a question here. And, I'll, and then here, and, and then I'll come back to you. Yes. We have to end? No. I'm we have to go to the side. OK. But, but here, there. And then, Thank okay, you. I'll try. I'll try oh. to remember. Thank you very much. Uh, Two-part question. Uh, you mentioned your priorities, Europe and the United States. Europe seems ahead of the United States on BDS, if I'm not mistaken, but if I am, correct me. Uh, and uh, how about other countries, uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and also the third world, Latin America? And the other part is the devil is in the details. Following up on the gentleman's question on the uh, right of return, how do you frame it? I mean, uh, for example, a lot of the Palestinians uh, who would have a right of return would not return, perhaps a large majority and so on. And so how is this framed in a way that you can have some kind of, uh, let's say, negotiation uh, uh, with uh, the Israeli government, which is a, a reality? Um, on the right of return, as a human rights movement, we focus on the right. We're not the experts to develop the modalities of return. That requires certain expertise, the United Nations and so on. But the United Nations has developed a plan and implemented a plan of return for refugees of Kosovo, former Yugoslavia. 
Kosovo and Bosnia, Bosnia, we already have seen the UN implement the return of tens if not hundreds of thousands of refugees in those areas. Uh, uh, reparations, repatriation, and so on and so forth. So it's not completely unprecedented. There are precedents uh, to this. But again, it's well beyond our mandate as a human rights uh, movement working for the right. Uh, but I get this all the time, this kind of uh, uh, implicit, uh, imp implicit point that we hope that not too many would return. <laughs> I know you did not mean that, but I, I'm, I get that. We hope that not too many would return, that so many Palestinian refugees would decide to stay in Canada or the US or, or Lebanon or, or whatever they are, Jordan and, and so on. Why is that? Why, why, is there such, why are people wedded to the idea of maintaining this one case of a racist supremacist state on earth? No other country can claim a divine right to be a racist supremacist state except Israel. Why should anyone protect that order? I, I, I don't understand it. Yeah, but the assumption being that we have to convince Israel to give up and give us our rights, it's not a matter of convincing, it's a matter of compelling. It never was. Masters never give up power, never. It's only the resistance of the slaves and the massive solidarity with their struggle that forces the masters to give up their colonial privilege. That's the only way. Okay, on the other part, sure. Yes, BDS in the last few years has spread a lot in the global south, in the Arab world for sure. Many of the campaigns I mentioned, like against G4S, uh, against Veolia, against Orange, uh, the Arab BDS campaigns played a critical role. I think BDS Egypt single-handedly was the reason why Orange quit Israel. BDS Egypt. They threatened Orange with, with a massive boycott in Egypt. Orange had 32 million customers in Egypt and some 1.2 million in Israel. So they pulled out. Uh, so it's spreading a lot in, in, in the global south, in South Africa, definitely. I mean, if there's a hub of hubs for BDS outside Palestine, it's South Africa. Uh, uh, I wouldn't say that the U.S. Is, is far behind Europe. In many cases, the U.S. is ahead of Europe. Uh, the work with churches, the work on campuses in the U.S. is, is well ahead of Europe. Uh, certainly, Jewish groups in the U.S., like Jewish Voice for Peace, we don't have the equivalent of that in Europe. We wish we can genetically clone JVP <laughs> in, in every European country and uh, Australia and Canada, and it would be great. We, we should actually only take two to three more questions. Last two questions, to, yeah. okay. At one so, time. So sorry, one here and one there. Sorry, I had to pick. You, one of you, decide. <laughs> Combine the question. So I'll come back. Uh, okay, she gave them the microphone, so I'll, uh, you'll be the last question. Um, to what extent should Palestinian students in the U.S. be publicly outspoken about um, BDS um, in person and on social media with the existence of like um, blacklist and the new travel ban on foreigners who support BDS in like sites like Kadari Mission? Uh, thanks for this question, and it's it's a, it's a tough one. Um, there's no easy answer to this. On the one side, on the one hand, we want to normalize our quest for justice and BDS being the most effective way to resist this injustice, especially outside. On the other hand, of course, we need to protect Palestinians uh, in this country who want, who wish, who must go back home. Because if they come out on their Facebook and Twitter in support of BDS, they will be banned from entry. They cannot go back to their homeland. So we suggest using pseudonyms. We suggest not using your name Try in any way not to use your name. Or if you join a campaign for justice uh, and freedom, it doesn't have to carry the BDS logo. It doesn't have to say boycott and it doesn't have to say BDS. Uh, there are many creative ways how to do things without labeling it as, as BDS. But certainly using pseudonyms, we highly, highly recommend that for Palestinians in particular, but everyone who cares uh, uh, to go to Palestine as well. Uh, but of course, that doesn't mean we should not challenge this. Some uh, groups in this country are, cons are, con are, are thinking of ways to challenge the ban by going there and announcing 
that we support BDS, ban us. And then it'll be a big media scandal and so on and so forth. So there are many tactics how to challenge Israel. We should not accept it as a fait accompli. As, as you know, the, whatever Israel, uh, whatever draconian measure Israel decides, we accept. No, we don't accept. We challenge it. But in the meanwhile, we have to protect our identities. So the last question. Yeah, I'm sorry. There, I, had I, had I, had I was told I can only take two questions. I'm sorry. I had, I had planned on uh, asking that uh, right of return question before that other person did. But my follow up on that is, uh, yeah, I, don't, I know you don't like the idea of saying maybe a lot of them won't return. But I'm wondering if you've thought about the uh, uh, example of Jews being able to return to Europe. I would be pissed as hell if somebody said to me, you may not return. You know, we have the, I have the right of return. If I went back to Poland, my, both my parents' villages are gone. I mean, you know, the, uh, when we were there, we couldn't even find a uh, tourist office that would have been able to tell us where those villages had been. Uh, but we met other people there that just wanted to see where the parents had come from. Now, the people who are going back to uh, Germany don't have their old homes to go back to. I mean, it's very much the same kind of situation. But they wa those people want to move back. I don't know that there's a lot of people who want to move back to Poland. But uh, those has, has, ever been, has that ever been, uh, I mean, the, that experience, you know, with the Jews going back or not going back, has that been used at all as a parallel? Yes, actually, in my talk yesterday at Harvard, a Jewish uh, uh, daughter of Holocaust survivors said that after Trump's inauguration, she considered returning to Germany, where her parents had come from. Yeah. And she thought this was the irony of ironies, that she would even consider going to Germany. But only with Trump, she entertained that idea. <laughs> but she said, as, as a Jewish woman who has this right, and Germany <coughs> makes it perfectly easy, to go for any Jewish descendant of, of German Jews to go back to Germany and to receive reparations for any pillaged property, pillaged uh, uh, silverware, uh, whatever. Uh, she felt, why can we enjoy this privilege and deny it to the Palestinians? We have to be morally consistent and insist as Jewish victims of the Holocaust that Palestinians have a right to return. Yeah, but humans country. get creative. You know, rebuilding communities that happens. You could go that, that you were allowed to go back. Yeah, but I mean, uh, people don't have to go back to the particular home that once existed. People rebuild homes. Right, right. People rebuild communities. <coughs> no, it's a matter of implementing the right. Yeah, that point needs to be made more public because people are thinking that they're going to want to go back. But, yeah. To the yeah. Pale, airport, True, build, but, but, but just to, to conclude this discussion. What concerns us as human rights defenders is upholding the right. right. There are many details that need to be discussed and are very important, but those will be discussed by more, uh, by experts who can discuss them based on international law, on former precedents and so on. In the time being, the challenge is to assert Palestinian rights, including the right of return. Thank you.